The following chapter is about hominid fossils, fossils in the human ancestral line. And I'm going to read just a very short passage about the famous fossil Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. The conclusion from studies of Lucy and her kind is that they had brains about the same size as chimpanzees, but unlike chimpanzees, they walked upright on their hind legs, as we do. Lucy's were a bit like upright walking chimps. Their bipedality is dramatically confirmed by the poignantly evocative set of footprints discovered by Mary Leakey in fossilized volcanic ash. They're usually attributed to a pair of Australopithecus afarensis walking together, hand in hand perhaps. But what matters is that by 3.6 million years ago, an erect ape walked the earth on two feet, which were pretty much like ours although its brain was the size of a chimpanzee's. It seems quite likely that the species we call Australopithecus afarensis lucis species included our ancestors of three million years ago. Other fossils have been placed in different species of the same genus, and it's virtually certain that our ancestors were members of that genus. The first Australopithecine to be discovered, and the type specimen of the genus, was the so-called Torn child. At the age of three and a half, the torn child was eaten by an eagle. The evidence is that damage marks to the eye sockets of the fossil are identical to marks made by modern eagles and modern monkeys as they rip out their eyes. Poor little torn child, shrieking on the wind as you were borne aloft by the aquiline fury. You would have found no comfort in your destined fame two and a half million years on as the type specimen of Australopithecus africanus. Poor, tall mother, weeping in the Pliocene. There's a chapter on embryology called You Did It Yourself in Nine Months. <laughs> <laughs> the allusion is to the same JBS Haldane whom I just quoted, who was once giving a lecture and uh, afterwards, in the questions, a lady in the audience said, uh, Professor Haldane, I simply cannot believe that uh, however many hundreds of millions of years there is, it's enough to turn a single-celled organism into a, <laughs> into a human being. And Haldane said, Madam, you did it yourself, but it only took you nine months. <laughs> The chapter has a fair bit about um, self-assembly of um, proteins and, uh, there's, and the importance of enzymes. There's a passage I want to read here trying to explain what enzymes do, catalysts in living cells. A chemistry lab has hundreds of bottles and jars on its shelves, each containing a different pure substance, compounds and elements, solutions and powders. A chemist wishing to perform a certain chemical reaction, selects two or three bottles, takes a sample from each, mixes them in a test tube or a flask, perhaps applies heat, and the reaction takes place. Other chemical reactions that could take place in the lab don't, because the glass walls of the bottles and jars prevent the ingredients meeting. If you want a different chemical reaction, you mix different ingredients in a different flask. Everywhere there are glass barriers, keeping the pure substances separate from one another in bottles or jars, and keeping the reacting combinations separate from one another in test tubes or flasks or beakers. The living cell, too, is a great chemistry lab, and it has a similarly large store of chemicals. But they aren't kept in separate bottles and jars on shelves. They're all mixed up together. It's as though a vandal, a chemical lord of misrule, entered the lab seized all the bottles on all the shelves and tipped them with anarchistic abandon into one great cauldron. Terrible thing to do. Well, it would be if they all reacted together in all possible combinations. But they don't. Or if they do, the rate at which they react together is so slow that they might as well not be reacting at all. Except, and this is the whole point, if an enzyme is present. There's no need for glass bottles and jars to keep the substances apart, because to all intents and purposes, 
they're not going to react together anyway, unless the right enzyme is present. The equivalent of keeping the chemicals in stopper bottles until you want to mix a particular pair, say A and B, is to mix all the hundreds of substances up in a great witch's brew, but supply only the right enzyme to catalyze the reaction between A and B and no other combination. The chapter called The Arc of the Continents is about the very powerful evidence from the geographical distribution of animals and plants. If you look at the distribution of animals and plant species on the islands and continents of the world, it follows exactly the pattern you would expect if evolution had taken place. <coughs> it's almost too ridiculous to mention it, but I'm afraid I have to because of the more than 40% of the American population who, as I lamented in chapter one, accept the Bible literally. Think, think what the geographical distribution of animals should look like if they'd all dispersed from Noah's Ark. <laughs> Shouldn't there be some sort of law of decreasing species diversity as we move away from an epicenter, perhaps Mount Ararat? I don't need to tell you that that is not what we see. Why would all those marsupials, ranging from tiny pouched mice through koalas and bilbies to giant kangaroos and diprotodonts, why would all those marsupials, with no placentals at all, have migrated en masse from Mount Ararat to Australia? Which route did they take? Why did not a single member of their straggling caravan pause on the way and settle in India, perhaps, or China, or some haven along the Great Silk Road? Why did the entire order Edentata, all 20 species of armadillo, including the extinct giant armadillo, all six species of sloth, including extinct giant sloths, and all four species of anteater, troop off unerringly for South America, leaving not a rack behind, leaving no hide nor hair nor armor plate of settlers somewhere along the way? Why were they joined by the entire infra-order of caviamorph rodents, including guinea pigs, agoutis, packers, maras, capybaras, chinchillas, and lots of others, a large group of characteristically South American rodents found nowhere else. Why did an entire suborder of monkeys, the patyrine monkeys, end up in South America and nowhere else? Shouldn't at least a few of them have joined the rest of the monkeys, the catarines in Asia or Africa? And shouldn't at least one species of catarine have found itself in the New World, along with the platyrines? Why did all the penguins undertake the long waddle south to the Antarctic? <laughs> Not a single one to the equally hospitable Arctic. <laughs> Once again, I'm sorry to take a sledgehammer to so small and fragile a nut. <laughs> but I have to do so. <laughs> I have to do so because more than 40% of the American people believe literally in the story of Noah's Ark. We should be able to ignore them and get on with our science. But we can't afford to because they control school boards. They homeschool their children to deprive them of access to proper science teachers. And they include many members of the United States Congress, some state governors, and even presidential and vice presidential candidates. They have the money and the power to build institutions, universities, even a museum where children ride life-size mechanical models of dinosaurs which they are solemnly told coexisted with humans. And, as recent polls have shown, Britain is not far behind, or should that read ahead, long parts of Europe and most of the Islamic world. <laughs>